Hi folks, how are you? Um, great, um, it's absolutely brilliant to be here. Uh, it's a long way from the Loophead Peninsula to Dublin. Um, so it was an early start this morning. Um, I suppose we've, uh, we've done a lot of work with the Heritage uh, Council of Ireland. Um, the whole ethos behind setting up Loophead Tourism was that tourism would work for us. It becomes ours. The local community would make money out of it. Uh, it's not just a place that people come and visit and disappear. Um, leaving CO2 and tire tracks and rubbish and all the money disappears off into the ether mm. somewhere else um, so fundamentally we um, we have set it up so that uh, tourism and anything that you know, copyright or whatever you want to talk about it you know it's ours uh, and it's ours to do with as we would like it not that uh, there are plenty of places in the world where people come and visit uh, fly in leave a few quid into a couple of big operators and bail out and leaving very little for uh, the local economy. So that's fundamentally where Lupe Tourism started off. Um, so we I'm not sure if anybody I'm familiar, we are on the very farthest tip west of the county of Clare. We could see the direction tourism was taking and uh, we decided the community was time to take control of it ourselves. Uh, we, we live what we call on the Dingle to Doodle motorway. Um, four million visitors a year pass up and down past the front, our front door. And I guess it was only a matter of time before somebody decided they were going to take a left turn and all of a sudden we were going to be left with uh, as part of the motorway. We just wanted to develop it to make sure that it was a place that we wanted to live in rather than a place people just visited. Um, if I was modest, I guess I would say that we have been reasonably successful, but I'm not. Okay. Um, <laughs> <coughs> we've actually been really, really successful. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, for a small community group, we've done a pretty good job. Um, and to be fair, well beyond any of our expectations. Are you sorry, are you volunteering? Yes, okay. completely. Yes. Um, yep. So I own a restaurant. Uh, that's my business. And in the middle of the other 20 hours a week, uh, wherever I can find them, where to do this. Um, so we kind of rode the crest of the Wild Atlantic Way development. We were a couple of years down in front of them. So as they were picking up speed and doing a little bit of marketing and branding, uh, they were looking for destinations along the Wild Atlantic Way that, that epitomised what they were talking about because they actually only had some signposts and um, what they needed was some destinations and some people to go to these travel shows and go actually this is what we're talking about these guys over here and um, so we got a lot of uh, we got a good kickstart that way from a point of PR I suppose and branding point of view uh, but it's very front and centre um, it is going to bring, I heard a great phrase recently, the Wild Atlantic Way has democratised the West of Ireland. I thought it was absolutely on the money. Uh, it has given every small village and town the exact same opportunity uh, as everywhere else. Um, it's going to bring visitors completely off the beaten track and parts of Ireland that I haven't heard of are going to see visitors uh, for the first time. But the problem is that there is a danger in this and that it becomes the same. Okay, So it just becomes like a, you know, we've all seen the videos guys, you know, beautiful, wild, rugged, sea, Lovely music, uh, deep voice talking about this lovely scenery we're talking about. <laughs> but the trouble is, it's just in danger of becoming a bit of a blur. You know, it's like a, a HD video on the front screen of your car, a uh, windscreen. Um, and I think that the real challenge was for communities to make, sh to, ch to make, to change it so it became theirs. So what we set out to do, and a challenge I think for every destination, and indeed, uh, you know, anyone. I mean, I'm coming from a tourism point of view, but it's kind of quite specific. <coughs> side of tourism, uh, very community based, um, was to turn the Wild Atlantic Way into our Wild Atlantic Way. Uh, we had to take ownership of it, define it, um, and I'm, I, I, I absolutely for sure, I know I'm, I'm giving a talk in Carlingford there uh, next month and it's, it's going to be exactly the same thing for the uh, Ireland's Ancient East. It's going to be really key that uh, places come together and define themselves to be put on the map of this, this route that's, that's being developed. Um, for us, what's the difference between those beautiful craggy cliffs on Galway or Kerry? Not a lot really. They're all beautiful, they're all stunning. Um, actually at the minute we're getting some serious press out of a group of 20 basking sharks that have been feeding off Kilkee. Um, so, brilliant. Stuff like that. Can't be being lucky, let's. Um, <laughs> the real difference is our people and our story, um, basically our, our heritage. Um, now we have a bit of history tying our history into tourism development. Um, our maritime heritage was a key component when we won the European Destination of Excellence Award in 2010. 
Um, so the West Clare Curragh Club, um, I would say, single-handedly responsible for rejuvenating the building and racing of Curraghs in, in County Clare. Um, um, went on to be a, another project called the Shoal Shunna, which was a traditional funded project, leader funded. Um, we built a Shannon Hooker, and it's used today by the Shoal Shunna group as a safe training vessel. Okay, so just a nice little project. So the Loophead Heritage Trail is an abject lesson in patience. <coughs> we actually made something out of nothing. Okay, um, it's an organic process. We did not set out to develop a heritage trail at all. Uh, it kind of grew out of circumstances. Um, in 2011, we wanted to identify a route around the peninsula, our route. So, um, anyone who goes anywhere, you, you know, you 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 kind of drive along and you have this uh, view and you think that's lovely, and then someone says to you, "Geez, you should have seen it if you were driving the other way." Actually, you know, the real view is that way, and that's local knowledge. So we had to look at a driving route around the peninsula that tapped into our knowledge of where we live. Um, so this is what we came up with. We didn't do a bad job. Uh, it's actually nearly 100% the Wild Atlantic Way through the Lubet Peninsula, um, which is also testament to Fault Ireland's public consultation process. So the next logical step was to fill in the blanks. We realised pretty quickly that as a voluntary group we couldn't do all the work ourselves, so we had to get other people involved, and what we did was we set up a number of focus groups, um, each with their own particular interests. Um, so we kind of ended up with active on the land, active on the sea, uh, we had one, this one for kids called Explore the Shore, which was uh, on the back side of this is the map, okay? And on the this side is like a tick the box. So send the kids out. Mm -hmm. um, what it did was, all these things showed people uh, when they were in any particular village that there's actually more to see in the area. Okay, so that, and here's a, here's a route you can take, <coughs> and these are the type of things you can see in the area. So it sends them off. It means that they're comfortable, they have a map, and B, they're going, ooh, it's a bit of a treasure hunt. Um, and especially, you know, I, I, my business is a very family-based resort, so we really did have to be family-based. <coughs> so one of these was a heritage, local heritage group. So we looked at what the community was doing themselves already locally. What we did is look at how their interests could work from a tourism point of view for us. Um, so how can we use the output of their interests <coughs> and combine it into products that the tourists will find interesting? So we spoke to some local historians, we spoke to the Civic Trust in Kiki, um, and we ended up with a locally uh, heritage trail based around the peninsula. Um, autumn 2012, we identified 27 sites um, that were of primary interest. Um, so in 2013, we put a proposal together to uh, Clare Local Development Company um, for leader funding for a 12-week heritage project, training workshop that we call Learning from the Landscape. Um, key outcomes were on the, s on the screen, a knowledge and understanding of our local built heritage and necessary skills to look at further research. Um, so uh, provide opportunities <coughs> for individuals and communities to identify and develop new or existing responsible tourism projects that were heritage based. Um, we had 16 people take part, ranging from everything, accommodation, food, we actually six people who were not, no interest in tourism at all, no connection <coughs> whatsoever, just interested in the heritage side of it. Um, and we ended up with a number of those who set up their own business. So we had a German lady who lives in the peninsula. She is doing a German language guided walking tours. Uh, two girls, they did a, a, a project on a local guy called Henry Blake, a blind historian and crafts guy, man, um, and subsequently used it as a springboard to open a little museum and craft shop. Um, so that's really our heritage being put to work and value being placed on it. Um, a lot of all of these, you know, fed into existing products. So for myself, I'm in a restaurant, I can talk to people, and somebody says to me, oh, we're here because we really like, you know, your, your, your castles. Well, I now have a little bit of a story to tell them about the castles, because I have a little bit of knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert, but I have a little bit more knowledge of all the different places. And some of the places that we got to see, even as locals, we wouldn't have known that little backstory about them. Um, so we had a bit more knowledge, and we passed that on to the visitors. <coughs> So this is just a list of the, some of the people who spoke to us. So as you can see, it's really, really kind of broad spectrum. Um, some really good, really, really good people and some brilliant days out. So we'd have a day in a class and maybe the following week we'd have a day out um, in the, uh, on site. Um, as I said, look, a lot of people, we're not trying to produce exports, but we just wanted people to be able to deliver a sense of the place to visitors who asked. Um, 
And then some of them would go on to generate a little bit more specific interest and maybe get a little bit deeper knowledge. So at the end of the uh, thing, everybody did a project. Um, we had an exhibition and invited the local community, Fault Ireland and Clare County Council uh, to it in the form of uh, Kinchella Maguire, who's the heritage officer for the council. So to be fair, we had over 200 people in the golf club. Um, it absolutely knocked the socks off us because really we didn't think that there was that much interest. I mean, there were 16 of us showing. I, I genuinely, with friends and family, if there had been 80 people, I would have been happy like mm -hmm. So there was a big interest. Um, and I suppose the other side of that was that it came from the fact that the broad spectrum of the course meant that we were talking to a lot of other people around the peninsula um, about various bits and pieces, asking for permission to get into to, to look at a ring fort or, well, why are you doing that? It's a conversation starter. That, that old thing, yeah, it's two and a half thousand years old. <laughs> no. um, please don't drive over with the tractor. Fault <laughs> um, Ireland, we're looking at how can we uh, bring the communities more into the Wild Atlantic Way? How can we make this work for the communities more than just a tourism product? Um, so we put a pros together um, <coughs> to Fault Ireland, the Heritage Council and Clare County Council that we would be used as a pilot project to place local communities at the heart of the Wild Atlantic Way. Um, so basically turning it from a strip of tarmac into a kind of a, an experience. There are all our funders, God bless them. Um, a company called Active Me got the contract. Um, so we set up a very small sub subgroup because they always work better if there's one or two in the committee. <laughs> <laughs> get stuff done. Um, well, it wasn't quite that small, no, there was, I think it was three of us. Um, <laughs> so we narrowed our 27, um, our 27 points down to 14, and some of those were stripped out because they were duplicated in villages or towns. Some of them were stripped out because they had access issues or logistically it was impossible to get access to them or parking or it wasn't safe. So we ended up with 14 and we ended up with, we added in the four uh, discovery points that uh, the Wild Atlantic Way on, on the peninsula. <coughs> so once the sites were confirmed, uh, the real work began, archiving, looking at databases, not me because that's now I don't have the patience for that. Um, but this is basically <coughs> the, the, the key work uh, that was, was done. Um, desktop was very factual um, field work. We had a few people involved in other stuff so they kind of rode in behind that. Um, interviews, that was for us being able to introduce the right people to, to the uh, active me people. Um, and the database, they ended up with, uh, we, we ended up with a database, thankfully, which I had nothing to do with because my boredom threshold is actually phenomenally low. Um, but running slightly ahead of this, and this is actually was fundamental and really, really key to the, the success of it. Two local women had uh, got funding from the Heritage Council to undertake a project that um, audited the Heritage Audit um, on the Lupet Peninsula. And over the course of three months, they audited nearly 900 items. They added 332 previously unknown items uh, to, the, to the heritage database of the peninsula. So these unrecorded um, uh, heritage items on the peninsula. Um, so it provided an awful lot of the detail for the heritage trail. Um, and I think this is quite a small investment from the Heritage Council. Um, meant we ended up with far bigger detail from, for our project than we would have normally got uh, if these guys had just been doing a desktop survey. Because there were local people, they could get access to places that officials will never get access to. I mean, you just rock up with your Clare County Council badge or your even your heritage, or, you know, or, uh, <coughs> and lads just going to go, no, a guy in a suit or with a clipboard, sorry. <laughs> um, that's just the reality of rural life. Um, so these were two local girls who could make the connections. They knew who to talk to. Sometimes you're looking at a piece of land where two brothers own it, or it's commonage. You know that if you talk to the wrong person, you're never getting in the door. If you talk to the other person, it's not a problem. So that's the real uh, thing of local knowledge. Um, and what it ended up doing, though, really was it kind of put a value. People, like I said, that old thing, really? Yeah, uh, it's really valuable. It's really, uh, it's an incredibly important piece of architecture or um, uh, ancient heritage or a, a, a ring fort or whatever. And they kind of go, really? And you go, really? Local interviews, key component, I'd like to introduce it to our local county councillor. 80% of the um, interpretation material came from these interviews, including a song from him. Okay. Are you right there, Michael? Are you right? <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, this is uh, another guy, Jeff McGee, um, on the left. No. <laughs> uh, he is a boat called Dolphin Watch, um, and he has an absolutely phenomenal uh, natural heritage product um, on the Shannon Estuary. Um, two outcomes from the project. As a pilot project, it produced a methodology so that other destinations, communities can look at it and say, well, we would like to go down that road. Fall to Ireland, have it. You're knock yourselves out. It made recommendations and a model for working with the local communities and stuff like that. Um, but I guess for us, you know, we're in the tourism industry, um, developing the place from a tourism point of view, and we had to get something out of it as well. Um, <coughs> so we got design ready interpretation contact. We got a database. Okay, uh, not very exciting. Cloud-based on Maker.net, um, which meant that there is only one copy. It's based in the cloud because anyone here who deals with databases know there's five copies, five different versions of it. Who's got the most up-to-date version? It's a nightmare. Um, we have three people with access to it. Anytime one person makes the change, everybody gets it. <coughs> uh, so there's no um, wondering which is the right copy of the database. But the first thing we could do was link straight into our website, loophead.ie. Um, which meant that immediately anybody looking for uh, from to come to Loophead could be directed to our heritage product. So there's an awful lot of options. Uh, at the minute, we're using a company called Labarta Audio Guides, and they're putting a 60-minute audio guide together for us. But what the database did was it gave them a huge amount of information that we wouldn't have had to. We would have had to pay them to do that research. Actually, we all we had the research here already. Um, all of the the, there, I think there's 56 uh, clips, sound clips in our heritage database of local people telling like a minute and a half or two minute story. They will be slotted straight into the, uh, the audio guide. So we will have somebody narrating it and then he will introduce Eilish Connolly talking to you about the little arc and whatever. So it does bring that real local uh, flavor into the, into the audio guide, which will be quite different, I think, to a lot of other ones. The audio guide will be an app and it will be, we'll have a widget which can fit into your, uh, our, our not only Lupe's uh, uh, website, but all our members' websites. It also means that when you book your accommodation at the Lupe Peninsula, they can send you a lovely email saying, thanks very much, but when you're coming down, why don't you have a look at this click? And they just insert the, 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 the link to your, you can download the app, and before you come here, you have it in your, the audio guide as an app with the map in your back pocket. Um, so it is really, um, the, the peninsula actually is, I think, 95% uh, surrounded by protected areas. So we had to be really, really careful about how we go about putting heart interpretation on the site. So what we're ending up doing is we're going to end up with a very small A4 size little thing like this uh, at each point with a QR code which will link you straight to the audio guide, will link you straight to the app. Uh, we got a print ready map uh, which we made into little Z cards. The database was also formatted, that meant that each little village in the peninsula, the information could be concentrated for each village. So if we want to do a map for each village, we can do that. If we want to, um, if the audio guide, if each village wants to do an audio guide of their own, we have all that information available. So while the database wasn't really that exciting, it actually, the amount of stuff that we can do with that database is phenomenal. We have a heritage trail that comes from within us. It's ours, it comes from the community. It's factually correct, but it's not delivered in purely factual terms. Um, it has made the locals more aware of their heritage, but from a visitor's point of view, I guess they can hear local stories told by local people. In 2015, we entered the Heritage Trail for the World Responsible Tourism Awards, and we won it, God bless them. Um, and at the same conference, at the same uh, conference I presented the Heritage Trail, um, sorry, I, we entered it into the best destination in Ireland, and I presented the Heritage Trail at the conference, and we were encouraged to entered into the worlds, which we did and we won in London uh, last December. Um, and funny enough, it's still a work in progress. I, I, you know, this is one of those things I think that in 10 years time we'll be back here talking to you saying, well, actually we've done all these other things as well with it. Um, but one of the most important things and I actually had in my uh, original thing and I wrote it down today was, um, tourism is placing a measurable economic value on our local heritage. Okay, it's a really hard thing to do to value. How much, how, what's it worth? Tourism is one way. Now I do think that there has to be very careful distinction made between monetizing something and making it, a, placing a value on it. Mm -hmm. You know, monetizing means that you can buy your way out of your obligation to protect it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna, I pay the fine. Um, but when you put a, um, a local economic value on it, it puts a responsibility on us as a destination. Um, 
and the Heritage Council of Ireland, we are working together. We work really well together. Um, so it's mutually beneficial for us to make sure that it, we keep it uh, in good order, but that it's also paying its way. That is a fundamental thing of the value. Um, that's me done. I hope I'm gorgeous.